Good morning, everyone. Can we greet our streaming family here today? Yeah. The multitude speaks. <laughs> God bless you. We welcome you. It's such a privilege to be here today. We honor God's presence in this house, and we pray specifically for you that you will be ministered to today, you'll be nourished today, and that you will be fed today. We're still in our series called On the Threshold, and today we're going to talk about power couplings on the threshold. But I want to speak today to some one oared people. Now, you know what happens when you're in a boat with one oar? What, what happens? You go in circles, right? <laughs> you, you need an additional oar in order to straighten out the boat to go in a straight line of conquest. And I believe with all my heart, last week and, and today, we're coupling together the idea of coupling. That I believe that we've gone as far as we can with one oar in our lives, in our ministries, in our relationships. Last week we mentioned Mark chapter 3. Remember in the synagogue there was a man with one withered hand. And we, we found out that that was an interesting metaphor. This man, something had happened to him in his life. We don't know what it was. The text doesn't tell us. But he was injured and he had to live his entire life one-handed. And you know, even with God's help and God's anointing, you can get a lot done with one hand. But you get a lot more done with two hands. And after Jesus said to him, stretch forth thine hand, he brought a healing miracle that brought balance back to the one-handed man. And I believe that I'm talking to one-handed men and women and the Lord Jesus. I, you've, you've learned to just get along with one oar, but it's exhausting. Think of how much more you could accomplish in a team yoked Effort. So we're going to talk about yoke fellows today. That's a term that speaks of God coupling us in our lives in an equally yoked basis with the proper people. Now, I'm not just talking about finding your spouse, all right? Because some of you are 79 and you're not going to have a spouse, okay? So the divine coupling teaching is going to have to uh, uh, exclude that. But I want you not to see coupling or when I speak of yoke fellows or I speak of, of power couples, I, I don't want you just to think of male and female because we look at David and Jonathan. They were a divine coupling that God placed together in a ministry for a yoke of anointing that was just amazing. Remember we found out last week that King David was a great shepherd boy, but he did didn't know anything about the protocol of the palace. So God had to yoke him up with a Jonathan, the regent, the very one who was going to inherit the throne from Saul because he needed to learn good table manners. Like Mike Fuller always said, I may get invited to the White House someday and we'll try to eat with my hands. Not a wise thing, Craig. Please don't do that. And so we need Jonathans to come into our lives to be a bridge between where we are and where we need to be. Jonathan becomes the second oar in our boat that allows us to move forward. So divine couplings, being, when I speak of yoke fellows, when I talk about couplings on the, on the threshold, I'm not just talking about male and female, husband and wife, though we are included inclusive of that concept. I'm talking about the fact that Paul and Barnabas were a divine coupling. They were yoke fellows. And Paul and Silas later in life were divine couple, divine couplings, uh, yoked together. Remember last week we found out about the book of Deuteronomy 22 verse 10 says, you shall not yoke, you shall not plow or yoke an ox and an ass. And what if... <laughs> and again, we haven't figured out yet who the ox is and who the ass is, but that's all right. We found out that, that, that oxes and asses have different temperaments and they're different sizes and they have different strengths and they walk at different paces and they have different eating habits. And so God, out of mercy to even his cre brute creatures, said, don't yoke an ox with an ass. You can yoke two oxes together. You could yoke two asses together, but you couldn't yoke an ox and an ass. And we talked about the fact that all throughout the Bible, God is the one who equally yokes us together with people, places, things, circumstances. And have you ever been unequally yoked in a relationship, a friendship, a business situation? Well, when you're unequally yoked, the the, the destiny is never accomplished. You can't plow a straight furrow. You never finish the task that was originally set before you. And so God is going to bring to each of us the yoke fellows that we need. And remember, a yoke is a wooden frame or a bar 
with loops at either end fitted around the neck of two animals which tied them together and forced them to function as one. So it's very important who you're yoked with. You show me your yoke partner and I'll tell you all about your life. Amen. Now, we want to be yoked with the Lord Jesus. Remember, he said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That's vertically. We are yoked to Christ. But horizontally in this life, to get anything done, we need to be equally yoked in all the saints said, amen, and all the ox and asses said, yeah. All right, good. So I want to get somewhere today. (laughs) So I want to talk for just a few minutes about I want to go to my last point on the notes, which is very predictable of me. I'm throwing you off right now. I want to talk for a minute about the picture that we have. It's important that we have a proper devil picture. We talk about a God picture being important. The most important thing about you is the first idea that comes to mind when you think God. And did you know everything I need to know about you? I will know if I understand your God picture. See, if you think God is just a great big uh, 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 version of your dad who's just going to frown at you and and, and always curse you and never encourage you, if that's your God picture, I can tell you what your, your capacities are. And so God picture is so important. In fact, it's the most important thing about you. If you don't see God as the triune loving center of the universe who who longs for you who adores you who 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 stares at you and never blinks he never takes his eyes off of you and invites you into the glorious dance of heaven if you don't see god as welcoming and loving and nurturing then you're never going to feel anywhere valuable in your soul you're not going to feel that you're valuable but you know as christians we have to have a proper devil picture mm mm-hmm. mhm Nobody ever talked to me about that. You know why? Because I used to think the devil could read your mind. Have you ever thought about that? Satan cannot read your mind. He's a creature. His demons cannot read minds. You say, wait a minute, I never thought of it. Yeah, only God knows all things. You know your own heart in a limited way, but the only other one inside of you that knows you is God. Demons cannot read your mind. They can't penetrate your thoughts. They can, watch, they can throw ideas in and watch how you react, which pretty much tells everything. Or they can just throw ideas in and you open your mouth and tell everything you know. Don't tell everything you know all the time to everyone. You're telling demons too. <laughs> you got you to watch just not that everything goes in your head comes out your mouth all the time. Well, my point is <laughs> it's important to realize I had one of my children lived their whole life not knowing Satan couldn't read their mind. They said, Dad, I wish you would have told me that when I was three. I said, well, I did, but uh, you, didn't, you didn't remember that, right? Because they thought they were having an internal dialogue with demons 24 hours a day, and they can't even read your mind. Boy, have they got you hooked. Well, what are those thoughts in my head? That's you. And, you know, any little friends you might need to have cast out, but they're only hanging on you, right? So here's my point. The devil picture that we have is very important, and you have to know the devil is a dog on a leash, and he's God's dog on God's leash. Don't you ever put the thrice holy God, the one holy and the three holies, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and put the devil up on the shelf with him. That's blasphemy. He is only a creature, and he is now a fallen creature, and he is a fallen judged creature, and he has more power than we do in the sense that he has access to spatial dimensions. Demons are sort of like we are disembodied. Like if you stepped out of your earth suit right now, you would be an invisible boy or girl, and you would have similar capacities that the angels have. Now, the fallen angels are only creatures. They're fallen creatures at that. They're limited as to what they can do, but they can do more than we can, just like if you were an invisible boy or girl. Hmm? You'd see what, what, what I could see what drawer you keep your underwear in. If I was an invisible boy in your house, I could see where you hide your treasures or hide your pornography or I know all this kind of stuff. But that wouldn't even be supernatural. That would be just super normal, right? The devil is a master magician and a super scientist. He is not even supernatural. His powers are not even supernatural. Only God can do a miracle. Satan does lying signs and wonders. So I want you to see something about the devil. He is a dog on a leash, but he's God's dog. He can never do 
any more than he's allowed to do. Now, he wants you to think he is God. He wants you to put him up with the Trinity, like he's a member of the Quadrinity. But he's only a creature. And if you don't realize that, then you're going to be uh, mythopoetically raising him up into levels that he does not warrant. Did you know either the devil wants you to think he doesn't exist or he wants you to think he's God? There's no in-between. He'd rather you just not think he exists. In America, we just don't even believe in him. Well, you know, the idea of Satan is just simply we personify evil, and it's just a name that we use. Mm -hmm. That's perfectly his doctrine. Now, you go over to Haiti, and you're going to see a whole different set of stuff going on with the witch doctors, the warlocks. and <laughs> Over there, he's active all the time, visibly moving all the time. Western countries, he'd rather just us be materialistic. There's nothing beyond my five senses. You better hope. <laughs> There's an old story of Robert Ingersoll, the famous atheist, and he was, he was getting up doing a lecture against hell, and four drunk guys in the back said, Make it good, Bob. There's a lot of us counting on you. <laughs> Do you see? Satan is real. Yes, Christ says he's real, but he's a creature. Now, why, why am I bringing this up? Because we're going to be talking about Othniel and Aksa today, the power couple of the Old Testament. Remember Caleb, our beautiful classic hero of faith. He's, he's now 108 years old, around about, and he's just about to pass, but he's passing the baton of legacy on to Othniel. Uh, which is his either his uh, uh, his nephew, or we don't know, quite know the relation, but he, Othniel, the Lion of God, that's what his name is, the Lion. And he's going to be married to Aksa, Caleb's uh, daughter, who's a little lioness. And, and the Lion and the Lioness are going to be the power couple of the Old Testament. And they're the ones that are going to face the enemy. But I want you to see that uh, both of them, Othniel and Aksa, represent what I'm calling the power couplings that the Lord is bringing together in the body of Christ. Yes, it can be uh, husband and wife. Yes, it can be uh, Paul and Silas is Paul and Barnabas is Jonathan's and David's. But beloved, we are moving forward into a new season of being yoked together with our counterparts in friendship, in love, in ministry. <sighs> Beloved, we've gone as far as we can with one oar going in circles. We need an extra oar in the boat. And, and everybody said, amen. <laughs> but I want to show you something about the book of Judges. Because Othniel and Aksa are coming to power. Remember, uh, Caleb is saying bye-bye. And Joshua is already dead. Moses is dead. Miriam is dead. Aaron is dead. Everyone but Caleb. Now, he's the only human being alive on earth that was in the first generation that came out of Egypt. The only guy. Now, you'd think you'd value him and want to, like, get him on tape and interview him on every matter. But he was probably ignored like everyone is in our time. But he's passing his baton to Othniel and Aksa. But I want you to see the time in which Othniel and Aksa live tell us a lot about them. They're a lion and a lioness, but they're living in the third generation. Remember what that was? That was the generation that rose up and knew not the Lord or anything he had done. And it says the third generation threw aside their faith in God and they became unequally yoked with the gods of the Canaanites. Well, let me explain a little bit about paganism. In the pagan worldview, you don't give yourself wholly over to anything. You have jurisdictional gods. This one's in charge of sex. This one's in charge of water. This one's in charge of this. This one's in charge of bacon. This one's in charge. So in, in a world, <laughs> the, a pagan worldview, you only submit portions of your life to jurisdictional gods, never all of your life to any of them. So in a way, in the pagan worldview, you are sovereign because you are only giving portions of yourself over to individual jurisdictional gods, which makes you sovereign. Hmm? It's a mix and match religion. 
little of this, little of that. Now, the people of God go into Canaan, and God says, please don't do the eclectic thing. Please don't say, yeah, Jehovah's God. He's, he's, he's over everybody, but I'm also going to go into the pagan temples on Wednesday and worship Ashtoreth a little bit. And then on Friday, I'll give a little part of myself to Baal. And the, but you know, we're going to keep God the big God. See, the history of Israel, they didn't disbelieve at all times in Jehovah. They just took on a mix and match view, which is what we have in our culture. See, what the third generation did was they became unequally yoked and they gave portions of themselves over to jurisdictional gods, which were little baby gods. And then they began to blend. Did you notice when your, your, your position of faith begins to slide, your whole moral life begins to slide? So this third generation is not faithful and unique and utterly devoted to the true and living God, but they are devoted to little gods. And what we found out in my teaching I did on, on idols called misguided love, that idolatry, very few of us would ever burn incense to Baal, but we will worship our opinion above that of anyone in the room politically. Amen. Amen. You will eat dinner and begin to preside at the table. And now, <clears throat> you're Democrats. <sighs> the Bible says, woe unto the man whose belly is full and begins to speak. <laughs> because that's when your idols come out of your mouth. That's when we find out what you worship. That's when we find out what your 100% focus is focused on. And it's never the devil, but it's just uh, your opinion on any matter. Bring up anything. See, I would like to hear what you say about God all the time, but rarely do people talk about God. They just open their mouths and their little gods come squeaking out. So remember, the pagans were, you know, they weren't just irrational nuts. They were people that just had a very selective mix and match view of religion like we have in L.A. Okay. All right. What? We mix and match. You pick what you want. You got your new age this. You got a little bit of that. You got, you know, you got a mixture over here. And if, you, if you're lacking something, you go to Malibu and they'll check your third chakra and then they'll add that part. And then you, before you know it, you're just totally a Californian. Take the 405 to the 1010 to the 10. <laughs> it's a pagan view. It's like, come on now. We're all, everything's true. All views are equally true. Now, what I want you to see is that in the context, before Othniel and Aksa come up, you got to know the context. The context is these, this entire generation has given themselves over in an unequally yoked union to all the gods of Canaan. And so the Bible says God sends them trouble. My God's a good God. He'll never send trouble. Oh, the first thing he did was he sent trouble. The man's name was Kushan Rishathaim. Who's Kushan Rishathaim? That's his name means the doubly evil one. He came from 400 miles away. He comes rolling through the, the land. And the Bible says God gave his people over. He brought trouble. God will never bring trouble. He'll take it away. Oh, he brings Kushan Rishathaim. If you can say that three times real quick, we'll give you the offering. All right. Well... Don't be hasty, Craig. So the Bible says God sent them trouble. He sent them Kushan Rishathaim. He sent them the trouble. Then secondly, it says God sent the answer. And then the answer's name is Othniel. The first judge. This is Caleb's relative. This is a, well, he's not really that young. I know we want to think of Othniel and Axel like the huge power sexy couple, you know, the Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie from the Mrs. Smith. No, no. He, at this age, he's between 75 and 90. All right? That's old now. All right. So he's still spry. <laughs> we don't know how old Axel was. May God bless her. We may have to retroactively pray for her right now because we have no idea what her age was. But the point is, they're a power coupling. But they rise to prominence in a time when first God sends trouble because of their sin, secondly, he sends the answer, Othniel. Then third, he sends the Holy Spirit of God that empowered Othniel. And then he sends rest. But God sends all these different things. Listen to my first point. When trouble comes, we have to have a proper God picture and a proper Satan picture. 
Okay, what is it? Is there anything of God's hand in this trouble that is in my life right now? It's an important question to ask, isn't it? Because we live in an age with Western Christianity teaching a prosperity thing like, you know, God never never causes trouble. God, oh, he brought Kushan Rishathayim. In fact, <laughs> let me read some, let me read a little bit of a tasty treat from Deuteronomy. This is what God said to his people. You ready? Let me read a little bit from Deuteronomy 28. I hope you can handle this. Haven't had lunch or breakfast. Have you? Good. If you do not carefully follow all the words of this law, which are written in this book, and do not revere this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, the Lord will send fearful plagues on you and your descendants, harsh and prolonged disasters, and severe and lingering illnesses. He will bring on you all the diseases of Egypt that you dreaded, and they will cling to you. The Lord will also bring on you every kind of sickness and disaster not recorded in this book of the law until you are destroyed. You who were as numerous as the stars in the sky will be left, but few in number, because you did not obey the Lord your God. Just as it pleased the Lord to make you prosper and increase in number, so it will please him to ruin and destroy you. You will be uprooted from the land you are entering to possess. Then the Lord will scatter you among the nations. Are we good? Are we okay? <laughs> Have I still got you? Okay, no, I think we everybody tuned out, Mike. All right, let, hold on, it gets better. It says, there you will worship other gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your ancestors have known among those nations. You will find no repose, no resting place for the sole of your foot. There the Lord will give you an anxious mind, eyes weary with longing and a despairing heart. You will live in constant suspense, filled with dread, both day and night, never sure of your life. In the morning you will say, if only it were evening, and in the evening, if only it were morning, because of the terror that will fill your hearts and sights that your eyes will see. The Lord will send you back in ships to Egypt on a journey and said, I didn't want to make this journey again. And there you will offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves. No one will buy you, however. <laughs> okay. You go, uh, what? That? <laughs> Amen, Gretchen. Now, 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 let me frame this context. All right. The first part of Deuteronomy 28 is all the positive blessings. If you, if you worship me, and you love me, okay? Everything's going to go fine, and you'll never see a two-headed dog, and all your kids will live. And, but at the end, when he says, and here's the frame, if you go into the land of Canaan, and you forget me, and you worship other gods, and you start sacrificing your, your children to Moloch and to Ashtaroth and Baal, then you will open the door for all of this to come upon you, all right? So the Lord sent the trouble. Here's the thing. The third generation gave themselves over to a pagan worldview. And because of it, they're the ones that invited all Kushan Rishathayim. Here he comes. He's called the double wicked one. Right? They didn't just get an enemy. They got a double two-headed, double wicked demonic principality and power who ruled over them for eight years. Okay? So the, here comes the devil, God's dog on God's leash, pounding them for eight years. Now, at any moment, they could, what's that R word? <laughs> Repent. <laughs> at any moment, they can say, wow, I think we're worshiping devils. Gee, I think we've forgotten the Lord. Gosh, remember our parents and remember all the wonderful things the Lord did? Any moment, they could repent. But they were so hard-headed, it took eight years of being hammered day and night. <laughs> now, have you know, one thing I've noticed in my life Things that used to come upon me or linger for two, three months now, I will rebuke in two or three minutes. Have you noticed there's a different time frame between when you get assaulted and when you rebuke something now? If I get assaulted by the devil, I pick the phone up right away and call Dennis, or I call Tom, or I call somebody right away, and I put the light on it, and boom, we blow it out. I'd sit in something for two months when I was younger and let it just torment me, ideas in my head just going around. Now, maybe two minutes tops. Because I'm too old now to waste any of my time with stuff that I don't need in my hamster wheel going around and around and around in my head. And you know what's interesting? The quicker you rebuke something and repent, or the quicker you apologize. Did you notice Kushan Rishathaim 
the problem isn't the Kushan Rishathaim. He was the earthly example of what was pounding them. But what was behind Kushan? Well, there was nothing behind it. It's just I'm God's favorite and the devil hates me. Wait a minute. We <laughs> dig a little deeper. If you are having prolonged assault in any area of your life, can we ask the proper devil picture question? Is God's hand behind any of this. Can we look at Deuteronomy 28 again? What was that old scroll, Deuteronomy? Ah, uh, boring. I heard it once already. No, no. Starting like about verse 50. <laughs> what, did, what did God lay out that we're going to bring on ourselves if we... It's all there. And you know what? Deuteronomy is the second mention of the law. God read it to them twice. And between two mountains, one mountain where they read the blessings and another mountain they read the curses and the children of Israel had to stand in the middle and hear both and they amened it all. They said, yes, Lord, if we worship false gods and we forget you, let all this happen upon us. They called it upon themselves. So when this stuff starts happening in the book of Judges, there's no mystery to the history. Get your proper devil picture. He's a dog on a leash and he's God's dog. So we don't want to blame him in a mythopoetic sense for our troubles. We want to, sometimes it is just demonic, cast it out, and it'll leave. If it lingers, <laughs> one of the most valuable things I ever heard was when Dr. Henry Cloud said, you don't have a problem, you have a pattern. Well, Jimmy didn't love me, and, and Billy didn't provide, and Seth wasn't affectionate, and, and James just was rude. And you know, you know what, honey? Maybe the only common denominator in all your bad relationships is you. Maybe Jimmy wasn't your problem. Maybe you have a pattern. I don't know. Let us now pray and take the offering. Do you know in your life when you have a problem, that means you can point to something or someone outside of you and you are exempt. You're not to blame. If you have a pattern, it's all about you, wonderful you, nobody else. <laughs> it's all you. A pattern is you. So we act like we have problems when we point outside, and yet God says, could you look a little deeper? Could we pull the veneer down a bit, maybe pull the veil aside? Is there anything of the hand of God in this difficulty that you might be able to trace the fruit to the root? What have you been talking about? Roots are always underlying fruits. Fruits are only symptoms. But we love symptoms, don't we? We want to judge people. I don't know if you've noticed, but she's a little weird. Have you noticed him? Yeah, lately he's just uh, he's, he's jerking to the left a, a little bit. There's a, beloved, there's always a fruit to every root that you see. We don't want to be addicted to symptoms because they, they are not what's important. If you lay an ax to the root problem, the fruit will die. And you will never have to see that fruit again. But if you just keep mowing it down with a lawnmower and you don't get to the root and you just mow down the fruit. Mm. So Othniel and Aksa are rising to prominence. And in our culture right now, the divine couplings, the yoke fellows God is bringing together, they may not be in your life right now, but they're on the way. Hope is on the way. Don't give up, you one oared people. I'm just going in circles. Yeah, and it's exhausting too, isn't it? <laughs> Land ho! Yeah, I don't think so. We're going. We need that second oar, and then you're going to get to your destination so quick. It's going to blow your mind. It's going to blow your mind. Remember, they were 40 years with one oar going in circles, and then Joshua came in, and they broke out of the circularity into a straight line of conquest. Well, the divine couplings I'm talking about are people God is raising up right now. Don't look at the devil. Don't worry about what the devil's doing. You don't need to bind him and loose him and curse him with bubblegum curses and may he make bubblegum stick on his talon and may he not be able to fly. Don't, don't go crazy. Your devil picture has to be, he's a dog on a leash and he's God's dog. So he's a creature just like your kids are creatures. So be aware of him, but don't be over-worshipful of him because that's what he loves. He's a mouse with a flashlight is all he is, trying to cast a big shadow on the wall. That's it. So acknowledge his existence, cover yourself in the armor of God, but give him no more consideration beyond that.
okay? And when you have an issue in your life, assume it's your pattern, and it's probably 99% you. That's why we have therapists. They're, they're, they're called people, uh, they're called helicopters of self-observation that we pay to fly into our lives and tell us all the horrid things our family sees, but we won't listen to them when they say it. You know, I, I think I have a problem in my life. And the therapist goes, no, I think you have a pattern. You know, you know when you reek of manure because you roll in manure and then you wonder why everybody won't hug you? What's their problem? <laughs> That's a pattern. And God is so gentle, but he's being deliberate right now. He's showing us our patterns because some of our patterns are keeping us from our divine yokings. Because people, remember when the, the ox and the ass are yoked? Well, the asses eat weird, bitter, poisonous herbs that make their breath fetid. <laughs> fetid breath. So the, the, the ass <sighs> exhales on the ox who pulls his head the other way and is now only plowing with one shoulder. <laughs> Amen. And we all know who the asses are, don't we? Amen. I'm an ox, clearly. <laughs> ah! <laughs> that was sure. Remove that woman. <laughs> Unyoke her <laughs> from, <laughs> from this ministry. <laughs> so, so God sends trouble in the form of Cushan Rishathaim, the enemy. Right? So the enemy was never the problem. You know, John Dawson once said to me, he said, Craig, if you see vultures flying 10 at a time in a circle, don't get your vulture rifle. You don't need a new Moody Bible Institute vulture rifle. Just find out what's dying and revive it. Because vultures only eat dead meat. So when you see vultures, you don't need to say, in the name of Jesus, <laughs> vulture rifle. <laughs> Just find out what's dying, revive it, and the vultures go away. Right? If you see flies on a mark and a cut in your arm, you need to find the cut and you need to heal it up, put a Band-Aid on it, and the flies go away. It's a causal fallacy we have going. We sell vulture rifles. Now, if I would have sold vulture rifles in the Christian world, I would be retired now on my prayer yacht, not praying for any of you. I would be on my prayer. I would be with Elon Musk going, oh, Elon, let's go back to the Bahamas. To, you know, we'd be flying on our plane. Because, see, Christians sell things like vulture rifles, but you don't need them. It's a causal fallacy. Find out what's dying. Revive it. And you know what? That marriage can be revived. That friendship can be revived. You don't need most of what the Christian community is selling, the Jesus junk at the Christian bookstore. Right? Hi, could, do you have any more of those testaments? Do you have any more of those Jesuses with the raspberry sauce? Inside? No, no, we don't. Yes, we do. They're all right here. You know, Jesus junk, you know, stuff that Christians peddle in the, in the house of God. And none of you know what I'm saying. Okay, let me move on quickly. <laughs> God sent trouble. Then he sent leadership. Then he sent the Holy Spirit. And then, thank God, he sent a generation of rest. After this power couple was done, Kushan Rishathaim was done. The second oath nail, the Lion of God and his wife, Aksa, stood up. Did you know a divine coupling only has to walk in the room and Kushan Rishathaim, the double wicked, collapses? He isn't the problem. He isn't the issue. It's not about the vultures. See, we go to therapists, and it's called the presenting problem. I have all these vultures. They fly over my house. I can't stand them, and I'm terrified of vultures. Now, we know it's not a vulture issue. It's your pattern. right? Vultures, but the therapist that you're paying $100 an hour for will nod initially for about five visits. Vultures, hmm, tell me more about them. Hmm. Were you attacked as a child? Yeah, I was. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there's a point where a therapist, hopefully, that is credentialed, hopefully, <laughs> will become a mirror to you at some point and say, you know, I've taken about $100,000 of your money, and I need to tell you, honey, you're the problem. 
it's you. I always tell people when I preach, don't do intercessory hearing for someone else. Oh, I wish Uncle Bob was here. Oh, damn, Uncle Bob. Why, is Uncle, why don't you hear for you? It's like the woman that went to the therapist with a poached egg on her forehead and a strip of bacon over each ear, and she said, I've come to see you about my brother. Intercessory hearing. All right. So, <laughs> the book of Judges is an interesting book. It covers a 400-year period, and it begins with the third generation having unequally yoked themselves with Canaan. And isn't it interesting that Kushan Rishathaim is a representative of all the gods of Canaan that they're worshiping? It's irony. It's like God goes, yeah, okay, I'm going to bring some judgment on you. Gee, what a shock. I guess you all didn't see this coming. Read all of Deuteronomy 28. Just saying. Um, <laughs> but you know what? As smart as we are as Christians, how many of you know we need to be reminded every day, all the time, God loves you. He has a plan for your life. His blood, praise God, is enough to cleanse. There is no dye of your sin that is deeper than the rich red blood of Jesus. His blood will cover everything. We need to be reminded, though, all the time about this. Because we see the devil attacking and we don't look behind that to see if there's anything we need to fix, anything we need to address. And that's why we have church. Did you know you can read the Bible at home, take communion at home, pray at home? You can play Scrabble at home. You can do all kinds of things at home, but you can't koinonia at home. You cannot fellowship face to face with your brothers and sisters on Zoom. It just isn't the same thing. We have to be in one another's life. I need you. You need me. And we need to be tactile and involved in a way that you can see my life in a way I don't see it. And I see your life in a way you don't see it. But you can't do that uh, in Guam, looking into, uh, into a Zoom call. You know, what's, I think, how are you? I don't want to. It's not the same. The, the online dating from the, I'm on the moon and they're on Mars and we've never met, but we're good. <sighs> Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as others have. We need this face-to-face -face, I thou, don't we? We need I thou time. I thou time. I get more now. Granted, we have to talk on the phone sometimes, but do you understand? You don't be allergic to the actual tactile intimacy God wants to have through brothers and sisters. There are certain things you don't say on the phone. <laughs> Now, power coupling. Hmm? You know, if you don't fit where you are right now, chances are you might be a pioneer. Do you know, if you don't fit exactly where you are in the friendship, the relationship, the marriage, the wherever, you might be a pioneer. What's a pioneer? Let me give you some traits, because all the power couplings I'm talking about, that Jesus is equally yoking together, all the yoke fellows that he's drawing together in this glorious yoke, so that we can move forward and advance. They're all unique. And that one thing they all have in common, they're all pioneers. What's a pioneer? Well, first of all, pioneers are never comfortable on a beaten path. Pioneers are originators. Pioneers are originators. If you try to put a pioneer with a person that's spiritually blind, you got the ox and the ass yoked again, right? You, you don't usually you would put an Elon Musk with an equally yoked individual that is a, equally a pioneer. Otherwise, probably relationships don't tend to work or last long. A pioneer has to be yoked with a pioneer or someone that isn't in direct opposition to pioneerness. <laughs> you can't be the anti-pioneer yoked with a pioneer. Gee, I wonder why we're not getting anywhere. All right. Pioneers are never comfortable on a beaten path. <laughs> are you with me still? You're still here? Good. Pioneers establish what will be normal in the future. Pioneers cut new ground. They make new ground. Aksa, this glorious daughter of Caleb, she was reserved all of her life because God wanted her yoked with the right guy, and it just so happened to be Othniel. Now, they grew up together in the wilderness. They knew one another. Their families were related. They were blood-related, faith-related. Uh, Othniel had caught faith by he, Caleb, his ancestor. You know, it's caught, not taught. Most everything you know is caught, not taught. You didn't formally 
learned two plus two is you're caught, you caught faith. You also catch unbelief. And so Aksa has grown up her whole life with Othniel, and they've already had this prehistory together, which is going to allow them to yoke at the right time. And when those two become yoke fellows, we have two pioneers in the same yoke. Hallelujah. And guess what? They advance so quickly. They advance toward their goal because they're equally yoked. See, you, you have to learn to say Othniel and Aksa. That's it. John 3.16, and you calmly can say Othniel and Aksa, the power couple of the Old Testament, Book of Judges, isn't it? Yeah, because they're the template of the yoking God is going to do. Now, there were there was a, a, a power couple in the New Testament I want to mention for a second to you. Because what we see in Othniel and Aksa, we see with a couple called Priscilla and Aquila. Did you know in the New Testament, we could call it hashtag Prequila, if we want to be cool, like Benefer or whatever it is. All right. Prequila, who are they? Priscilla and Aquila, they were the New Testament power couple. In Romans 16, 3 and 4, Paul names them both, Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ. And he acknowledged they risked their lives for me. Priscilla and Aquila are a New Testament equally yoked power couple. And they are absolutely amazing. Acts 18.18, 18, we find Priscilla and Aquila traveling and working with Paul as missionaries. They are yoked to Paul's ministry, and they are equally a team because they perceive themselves as a power couple team, and they are plowing in the same direction. They are focused on the same end goal, establish the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 says they planted a church together in their own home. So they open every aspect of their lives to the work of the Lord. No area is shut out. And they're a power couple. They're equally yoked. And this third part blows my mind. In Acts 18, 26, Priscilla and Aquila equally mentor the greatest evangelist of the day, Apollos. They were able to act as a team. And Apollo, who was Apollos? Apollos was the greatest preacher of his day. He was the Billy Graham of his day. But here's the problem. All Apollos knew was the baptism of John the Baptist. He didn't know about Jesus. So he's this uh, silver-tongued orator from Alexandria, Egypt, a genius. And he is a great communicator. He is the, the golden tongue, the silver-tongued orator of the day. But he is only as the gun's only as good as its ammunition. Amen. If you're just shooting bubblegum bullets, that's about as all you can be the most refined gun in the world. You're only as good as your ammo. And Apollos ran out of ammo when it got to John the Baptist. And it was a power couple, Aquila and Priscilla, an Othniel and an Axa that were anointed. Look at this couple. They were gracious. They were well-informed in the truths of Scripture. They appreciated who Apollos was. They saw his deficiencies, and the Scripture says they took him aside graciously into a safe environment, and they articulated more perfectly the gospel. And guess what? Apollos humbled himself, received the wisdom flowing from this power couple, and he, within a week, is back in the synagogue preaching Christ and him crucified. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Last week, all you knew was John the Baptist. Yeah. Well, I met this power couple, these yoke fellows that are a team that work well together, and they plowed more sound doctrine into me in a 24-hour period. I'm going right back to the seminar to teach on the deity of Christ. It's like, beloved, when power couples are anointed and yoked, things get done quick. It doesn't take you 19 years of seminary to instruct Apollos. Apollos was a quick student. And beloved, hear me, hear me. God is raising up a whole harvest of Apolloses around the world. These are men, women, boys, and girls who are talented, gifted, the Jordan Petersons of the world, the people who are sharp, and the people who are not sure what they believe, but God is honing in on every gift, talent, and ability. And guess what? They're going to need some folk who can be gracious and informed enough to mentor them and complete their knowledge, not judge them, 
Aquila and Priscilla didn't throw Apollos out going, you big horse's ass, uh, what are you talking about? You only know the baptism of John? Let me tell you something. First of all, you're ignorant. Second of all, you're ignorant. Third of all, you know, that's how we would handle them. <laughs> they graciously and respectfully took Apollos aside and this power couple. Mm. Notice their tone and body language is mature. Their balance, their theology is sound, and they're able to instruct this genius and complete his faith. And he was a yoke fellow with Paul and the body of Christ for the rest of his life because one power couple fulfilled their mandate. Someone say amen. That, that'll preach all by itself. All right, all right, all right, all right. So those pages can go. Pioneers are never comfortable with a beaten path. They establish what will be normal in the future. What you're doing right now may not be appreciated. It's okay. You're a pioneer. They'll get you later. I just wish they'd get me right now. Nobody's going to get you right now. You're probably going to be like Mozart. He was dead a hundred years before anyone would say, Amadeus is a genius. It's a, you're dead a hundred years? They can't even find your dust? Though I've seen some of it for sale on eBay. I wonder if I should buy a bit. Do you think? I don't know. Pray for me. My son Grant goes, look, Lincoln's bones right here. My dad bought them on eBay. <laughs> Gretchen, you're, you're going to have to be contained. Anyway, pioneers must not interrupt sermons. Oh, well, I'm sorry. That's not in there. <laughs> listen, listen. Now shut up. I'll be done soon. <laughs> I'm winding down slowly. Uh, the ark is going this way. All right. Pioneers must not be afraid of being utterly different. <laughs> oh, Othniel and Oxa had one another, man. Sometimes you just need one other human being to say you are clothed and in your right mind. There's nothing wrong with you. They don't get you yet. I'm behind you 100%. Don't waver. Don't falter. Go. Take over the world. Remember that Spider-Man scene where the girl says to Spider-Man, go get him. Go get him. You know, it's just like, wow. Just that one scene where his girlfriend says, I'm with you. Not, you know, you're probably going to drop dead as soon as you leave the window and you shouldn't be doing this anyway. Why are you leaving me? Okay, that doesn't work in the Spider-Man superhero. <laughs> it doesn't work. I'm just saying that out loud again. Okay. But I'm watching the tail end of that movie the other day and she goes, goes go get him. And I went, like, Yes! That's an oxa talking to an oath nail. That's a Priscilla and an Aquila, see? Whew. Pioneers must not be afraid of being utterly different. Next, pioneers must get used to being misjudged and mislabeled. Pioneers must be able to withstand and survive extreme pressure. Extreme pressure, because everyone in your time will not get you. But if you have one yoke fellow, one extra oar in your dang boat, you can advance one yoke fellow. Not third. Let's bring 30 yoke fellows onto the boat. No, 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 no. It's the spirit of confusion in the name of Jesus. You need one extra oar. So make sure when you're in a church, you're in a fellowship, that you are equally oared. That's just a, a new teaching coming out next week. All right. Pioneers must, <laughs> pioneers must be able to withstand and survive extreme pressure. Next, pioneers expect jealousy. They are not shocked by it. Expect jealousy. Why? Because people don't like different. People don't like different. They want what they are, and they don't want anyone else. And anyone else has got the, you have the gift of suspicion about everyone else. What's his trip? What's her trip? Huh? You've heard me say the old church ladies who used to have a young 18-year-old girl walk in and the church ladies go, I don't like her spirit. And so I don't think it's her spirit you don't like. Yeah, that, me too. Yeah, yeah, let's pray for her. You don't need to pray for her. She's prettier than you ever were, ever will be, even in your resurrected body, and it's jealousy. <laughs> Call Bible things by Bible names, please. Envy the green-eyed monster. All right? Don't violate her personhood because you're struggling with your envy and jealousy. Just call it what it is. You know what? It will endear you to them. You know, first of all, like I told you, I, I, I went to the Abercrombie store with the boy that didn't have a shirt. 
I said, I want you to know I gave up this job so you could have it. And, and he said, thanks, man. But it's just like, he was gorgeous. It's like, God made this creature, you know. He shouldn't have spoken, but <laughs> please don't talk. You know who you are. Don't. Like Gary Shandling once said, he said, I saw two ugly people kissing the other guy. He goes, you know who you are. Stop it. Stop it. Please stop it. I'm going where I'm going. I am completely in control. Pioneers expect jealousy, and they're not shocked by it. Next, pioneers are awkward risk takers, underscore awkward. They're awkward risk takers. They're going to go places no one has gone. They're going to cut a path where no one's been. And loved one, in life, sometimes God gives you a machete and a rainforest, and he just says, it's anywhere in that direction. And you, you're, we're looking for the Audubon. We want the well-trodden path. Well, the well-trodden path is lovely, but nothing grows on the well-trodden path. God is giving us a machete and a rainforest, and he's saying, go for it, sweetheart. Just do the next right thing. Take the next right step. Cut the next right bit. And that's all I've been doing for about 50 years. <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> I don't know, but he's in there somewhere. We hear him telling bad jokes. He's about six mile on. <laughs> yeah, we saw my boots four years ago. He's nuttier than a fruitcake. Well, I'm a pioneer, bless God. Amen. Be an awkward risk. <laughs> Be an awkward risk taker, I was going to say. <laughs> 50 and Theta Tom. All right. Be an awkward risk taker. Also, pioneers stand in the gap between different time periods that will produce two distinctive generations. Othniel and Aksa are pioneers, but they're equally yoked. What? What can we see in our time and our culture done by equally yoked, anointed, <sighs> risk-taking pioneers? Oh, it's going to be good, beloved. Don't worry how bad things may look right now because God in five minutes can reveal the men, women, boys, and girls who have been hidden in the mountains all their lives. And did you know the 7,000 that had not bowed a knee to Baal nor kissed his mouth? They were all in the caves being fed by Jezebel's table. But when they all came out of the caves, God began to couple them. That's what's happening. We keep hearing there's a new generation rising up. Yes, they are. They're coming out of the mountains. Yes, they're waking up from their lethargy. Yes, but they're being coupled right now. Because can you imagine when Adam and Eve, you heard it last week, Adam couldn't find of the dust of the earth anything that he could be coupled to. He named every animal, but not that. That's not it. That's not it. That's not it. That's not her. That's not him. I'm not my mom, I'm not my dad, I don't know who I am, but I'm not them, and I'm not that. And we find out that God gave a deep sleep upon Adam at Tardema. And it says he slept and he woke up and he saw Eve walked up to him, the divine coupling, the yoking of a lifetime, and he said, Zod, this is what I've been looking for. This is what I've been looking for. This. Yeah, Zod, there's a name, there's a word, this. But God had to make her because he couldn't find her. He couldn't find his coupling in his own strength. You love one. If you haven't been able to find your own coupling in your own strength, let it be. God will have to put a deep sleep on you, knock you unconscious, do special surgery, and then he'll walk up a completely yokeable friend. And I'm not just talking about male and female. I'm talking about donors as well. Do you know that there are benefactors to ministries? I remember uh, R Robbie was a dear friend of a woman from Church on the Way. And she was one of the prayer partners that had prayed in Pastor Jack Hayford's supporters and benefactors. Church on the Way used to have about 40 people. And this woman of God came into Jack's ministry and began to intercede and said, Pastor Jack, I mean, they did not have two dimes to put together. They couldn't pay a bill. They couldn't do it. You just can't imagine. This is a church that became a legendary megachurch and ministry. But in their early days, they had nothing. 
and they had no one supporting them until this precious woman of God started praying. She said, she's very soft-spoken. She used to come to our church years ago on Deary Road. <laughs> Robbie's friend. And, and, and we said, well, what, what did you do? She said, I just started praying that God would yoke up with Pastor Jack the proper benefactors that are called by God to support his ministry. Not somebody else's, not you've made a mistake and overshot by a block. Oh, I was supposed to give all this money to church on the bay with a B? Oh, dang. Oh, no. I give all mom's money to church on the bay. That's what I think has been happening to me for years. Give all your money to a Beth Al-Anon, Beth Ariel. No, 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 close, close. Dr. Greg Stimson. No! No! $30 million a blue-haired woman has given to Dr. Craig Thompson, who is now in the Bahamas. Doesn't even know he's a devil-possessed person, but he's got all her money. Back to the text. In conclusion... Pioneers stand in the gap between different time periods. Beloved, what God can do in a short period of time with yoked coupling, and he's going to yoke you with your benefactor. He's going to yoke a ministry. I, I would see it my whole life. Like 50 years I've been in little uh, pastor's conferences. I was in one in Seattle ages ago in the Mesolithic era. There were still dinosaurs walking. You know, and I'm there, and every, every, Every time there was a guy that would come up, you know, Pastor Jim Blingman, right? And he has 15 people in his little storefront church. And it was always the same testimony. Well, I was here at the conference. A man came to our church and went to the bank and put a million dollars in. (sighs) And everybody would yell. And I would always go, keep your heart up. Craig, don't let that knock you down. We all have our Jim Blingman in the future. It's all coming. But you hear this like a hundred times, and you start going, you know, are they missing the address? Is there a, the tongues of fire have gone out? What, what? God will even yoke you to your benefactors, people that get you, people that saw Picasso and went, why don't we bankroll him? I don't know what he's doing on the napkins drawing, but give him money. And before you know it, you're yoked up. And overnight, you can get more done with the slightest effort. I always say to my kids, what can you give yourself to 100%? What flows most naturally from your gifts and abilities? What blows your skirt up? What flips your switch? What produces the most amount of fruit with the least amount of effort? Pursue that. Pioneer but you may have to go where no one's ever gone before. Will you? Can you? We do not need a second-rate copy of someone else. We got them. We need you. Someone say amen. Lord, we don't even know what to ask for. We don't even know what yoking would look like, Lord. We don't even know what it would look like to be pl- yoked to an, two oxen together, two asses together, two, two pioneers together, Lord. We don't even look in the landscape of our lives sometimes, or the body of Christ, and go, yeah, there, there is an Othniel, there's an Axa, there's a Priscilla, there's an Aquila. Lord, we see so much imbalance, and we see so much unequally yokedness that, Lord, first of all, I pray that you would break despair off of my brothers and sisters right now. Who have, who have been unequally yoked in so many dimensions and have uh, been wounded and cut because of it, and, and, and that they're, they're hopeless whenever it comes to these teachings on yoking and power coupling. And, 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 and I, I rebuke that unbelief. I rebuke that bitterness, and I rebuke that self-protection that would cause your precious daughters, your precious sons to just be allergic to anything that sounds this good. Father, we rebuke and ask you to forgive us of our, of our senseless unbelief, Lord. We're just as unbelieving as the third generation that we're worshiping the idols of Canaan. We are just as full of unbelief. We are just as full of, yeah, but, yeah, but. Unbelief, sarcasm, cynicism, criticism. I rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus Christ off of everyone under the sound of my voice. 
And I pray right now a release, Father, for your people that have, that have been in the boat with one oar and they're just exhausted because they're in circles. And, and Lord, we pray that just like a, in a fantasy or a fairy tale, that the sky would split and the sun would rise and another yoke fellow would come and get in the boat with their oar, Lord. It doesn't even need to be golden oars or platinum oars or silver oars, just an oar, just a companionship, just the proper friendship, the proper love relationship, the proper ministry uh, partners, the proper donors that would actually get us and say, I want to support what you're doing. Lord, we pray for a, uh, in the name of Jesus that divorce us from the yoke of unbelief and bitterness and cynicism and sarcasm. We renounce that yoking in our lives in the name of Jesus, word, thought, or deed. Now, Lord, we pray that you would just cleanse us by your blood, Lord. Thank you that no dye of our sin can ever compare with the rich red blood of Jesus. We pray right now that you would divinely bring to us couplings, unions, yoke fellow relationships, Lord, where we could advance in seconds and take more ground than we have our entire lives before now, God. Lord, wherever it is, a business situation, financially, spiritually, emotionally, um, uh, therapeutically, if uh, yoke us to therapists who, who we don't have to fish around and find someone that gets us, but that you would yoke us with the right therapist who could help us Someone that could be a, help, a helicopter of self-observation that will bring us forward in our inner healing. In Jesus' name, thank you, God. Thank you for divorcing us from all the works of destruction and marrying us to new blessings, Lord. In the name of Jesus, add to us blessing and subtract from us the assaults of the enemy. In the name of Jesus. Someone say amen. I might start shouting. I might shout. This is enough. I'm stopping now by choice. You know I could go on indefinitely, and I probably will if Gretchen doesn't be quiet. So I'm going to better muzzle her because I'm just going to preach double, double long when Gretchen comments. <laughs> she says, I'm a shepherd abusing the sheep. Well, well. <laughs> Shaking them. Oh, speaking of that. <laughs> Should I mention the offering right now to the people? Yeah. Sheep shaking. That's what Daniel too says. Daniel says, Craig, you've never been a sheep shaker. That's your problem. You've never been a sheep shaker. You've seen them. They just shake you all the quarters out of you and everything. Well, we need a few quarters right now, lambs. Bad idea to bring this up. No, it's a good idea. So those of you that we love you, if we are feeding you, and I know that we are, I know there are some folk looking in. We call you the people in the peephole. I mean, you're, you're free to look through the peephole into Versailles, uh, but don't think this is Versailles. We do need your support and your love. And if you'd ever think of it, maybe you haven't gone to church in ages and you don't tithe anywhere, we would love you to support us. If we feed you, feed us, all right? Because I've got to write a check right now to the Hampton and Suites for $1,500, uh, of which we have 1200 in the bank. So if you wouldn't mind for me to withhold that, writing that, so I don't counterfeit anything or sin, and if you would be a support to us, we would appreciate it. It's such a, it's a simple place. It's good soil. It's good ground to plant in. Amen. And that $25 or whatever it is that you think, oh, that it's negligible. It's always important. It's always the right amount. Amen. Whatever that portion is, be consistent with it. And we would just love to earn your trust. We're not going to hunt you down in the night. We're not going to contact you and then, you know, sell you Jesus junk unless I come up with something really good. Like the vulture rifle. Tom, let's just talk about it and process it. We would sell the best vulture rifle in Christendom, right? Since Apollos himself. All right, so we don't do that. We don't chase you down. We don't hunt you down. We don't put you on a secret list as a platinum giver and then go to your kid's school. Or, but these are just ideas I'm thinking out loud about. So think about it. Pray about it. We certainly would love that support. We'd love to honor. We'd love to be honored by your support. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that we are going to plow a straight furrow in this church, that we are going to fulfill the destiny you've given us, Lord, that we're going to fulfill the will of God for our generation, as it's said of King David. We will fulfill all the will of God for our generation. 
and we will do it in an equally yoked fashion. And we thank you right now, God, that you are the focus of our worship, and the devil is a dog on a leash, and he's your dog. So we dismiss him for the curiosity that he is, and we honor you, thrice holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Amen. God bless you all. We love you. If you have any prayer requests, go ahead and send them in. And can we thank Mike Fuller for doing such a wonderful job bringing us to you live and posting us and doing everything behind the scenes. We love you, Michael. God bless you all. We hope today's message has been a blessing to you. And if it has, please visit our website at drcraigjohnson.org. There you can find additional messages of encouragement. And if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider us in your ministry giving, as we depend solely on the financial assistance of our listeners like yourself. Also, please feel free to send any personal prayer requests. You can find us online at drcraigjohnson.org. God bless you.